Career Track presents Confident Public Speaking with Dr. Rocco Pasco. When it's your turn to speak, do you choke and go blank? Does fear keep you from even beginning your presentation? In this two-volume program, Rocco Pasco shows you how to master your fear, plan your presentation, and stage your speech to produce powerful results. Rocco earned a Ph.D. in organizational communications from the University of Illinois. In his career, he's been a salesman, a consultant, and a university professor. He's also been a Green Beret, a carnival barker, and even rode with the Hells Angels. But what Rocco does best is help professionals like you become better speakers. With Rocco, you'll learn on two levels. While he explains how to use research and humor in your presentation, he also models what he teaches, using props and costumes to communicate his message. In part one of this volume, you'll hear Rocco discuss how to overcome fear. And now, Confident Public Speaking with Rocco Pasco. This morning, I'm going to sell you, and in fact market, the $11.98 Instant Professional Speaking Kit. For those of you who are afraid to look at audiences, we sell you for $8.98 this paper sack. Magically, they seem to almost disappear in front of your eyes. But of course, I've had people come up and say, well, that may be well and good, but your eye contact leaves something to be desired. For an extra $2, making it $10.98, we add the Instant Eye Contact Kit. And if you notice, I have perfect eye contact. I can look you right in the face, I can look at you, I can look over here at you, and each of you in the audience thinks I'm looking right at you. But of course, there's a third fear people have. What do you do with your hands? You don't want to put them in your pocket, as I just did. So what you want to do is you want to know what to do with your hands. For an extra dollar, the instant gesture kit. You close pin two hands to your lapel. You quickly move from side to side on stage, and as you move, you grab the lower lapels, and you move it this way. Notice the fluid gesture of the hands. And of course, that's the instant professional speaking kit. Wouldn't it be nice if we could learn to speak that quickly and that easily? But unfortunately, we can't. A lot of people have fear about public speaking. They say it's so tough, it's so complex. And that's really what we're about today. The program's going to talk about how to gain confidence, how to cure fear, it's going to deal with a lot of techniques. It's going to tell you how to better use your voice, your body, gesture. It's going to even tell you how to handle problem situations. Because so many times we look and say complex behavior. Recently, a woman went to a retail store and returned some presents, really a, a, a toy that she had gotten for her son, five years old. She said, this thing is just too complicated. We, he can't seem to get it together. And the retail owner said, we know. We've designed this to prepare your child for the world. No matter how he puts it together, it's always wrong. And what I'm going to suggest is that there are some methods you can use. Now, why communication? Why public speaking? As a matter of fact, if you look at public speaking, I could give you sources and keep you busy for an hour and a half on the importance of it. I can turn to management magazine after management magazine that will tell you. The biggest weakness executives have is how you communicate. Oh, they organize it. You've been trained to do that. They put it together well. But how to really use their body and use the media, that's where they really miss the trick. And as a matter of fact, we can trace it down. Hour and a half of studies from the time you enter the job market till the time you reach chief executive officer, and they've traced it. Technical skills are most important at the lower levels, but by the time you're mid-management, 77% of that job turns out to be communication. At the chief executive officer level, 93%, according to Minsberg. Lowell Thomas, introduction to a Dale Carnegie book, observes the fact that nothing gives you greater visibility than the ability to speak and communicate. And as a matter of fact, it's the number one fear, if you can do it well. People give you credit for intelligence out of proportion to your real intelligence. So it's important, all right. And what I want to address immediately and really talk about is why I think you ought to be listening to me. Rocco Pasco, R-O-K-O-P-A-S-K-O-V. That's my real middle name. My real first name is spelled M-A-R-I-J-A-N. I was raised on a pig farm in Waukesha, Wisconsin. My father collected garbage. I had no playmates in the country. I did not know that was an unusual name. In first grade, I went to a Catholic school. Sister Innocent called for Mr. O'Brien and then Miss Pascove. 
Do you have any idea what that does to the masculinity of a six-year-old boy? She continued three times, I didn't respond, and then she did something that was to brand me forever. She said, is Mary Jane Pascove here? In second grade, it got worse. Sandra Dernbauer decided that she loved me. Now, if a girl loves you or you love her in return in second grade, all shreds of masculinity vanish. I, of course, wanted her to stop. We rode the same school bus one night on the school bus, loudly so people could hear it. You're on the school bus. I said, Sandra Dernbauer, I want you to stop saying those stories. And I punched her in the arm three times. She loved me more. I put the word out I was going to whip Sandra during recess. I showed up short fight, she whipped me. That summer, behind the corn crib, I lifted rocks. I'll get Sandra next year. I started running. I was the littlest guy in class, but I got pretty wiry. First day of third grade, Jimmy Tegeter, one of the class tough guys, came up, and he said something smart, and I was so keyed for Sandra, I let him have it. When you draw blood in the third grade, that's kicking it. <laughs> and he was upset. He said that he and the two other class guys, Jimmy Tegeter and Mickey, Sh Jimmy Tegeter, Mickey Schramm and Bobby Jekyll, were all going to whip me during lunch hour. They were going to beat me up during lunch hour. A whole hour they were going to beat on me. And I had to show up. Matter of fact, I fought them one after the other. I whipped Jimmy Tegeter, Mickey Schramm, Bobby Jekyll. Littlest guy in class was now a class tough guy. Good news, didn't have to fight Sandra Dernbauer. I, I don't know what would have happened. But it did change my life. As a matter of fact, I became very macho. I have two union cards. I'm a mason. I'm a cement finisher. I decided that wasn't macho enough. I joined the old Special Forces Green Berets, and I developed a communication style that was simple. I would try to persuade you in the first sentence. If it didn't work, we moved to the second mode of communication, physical force. <laughs> it, it's not the way you want to operate. And as a matter of fact, I was so used to it that as a result of that, I developed what you call a speech hesitation. I became nervous. I didn't stutter. Couldn't think of the next word. I got so angry, and I'd go into that mode. In the winter of 1962-1963, I found myself on San Francisco's Skid Row. For those of you who are pursuing careers, and they often have ups and downs, you might take this down because I think it'll help you. If you're ever down and out in San Francisco, there's a number of places you can eat for free. Eat at St. Anthony's Kitchen in the corner of Jones and Golden Gate. It's not a very long lecture, and besides that, the food is pretty good. And I met someone there who was me 25 years down the line, and I said, I have no future. And I decided to go to school. A lot of different careers. A long time through school, I finally got a degree in organizational communication from the University of Illinois in 1974. Made a career shift five years ago. I now teach in a marketing department. I've just resigned that position for the last five years in the School of Business. When career track said, confident public speaking, I said, I'd love to. I know how important it is. I know the difference it made in my life. And so I'm delighted to be here teaching it. As a result of that background, you're going to hear several things I want you to be ready for that are different than the other programs you've been to. Number one, you're going to hear research the latest research from six disciplines, but presented to you in an interesting, usable way. Number two, humor. Research indicates if you can tie humor to the point, you're going to remember it longer and better. You're going to hear humor. A third thing that's different is I'm going to take you inside my head. At points, I'm going to have an organization and say, this is what I want to teach you, but we're going to learn on two levels. At one point, I may even say three levels, and there's going to come a point where I'll ask for a show of hands, and I will adjust you on the spot. Again. I'm going to share things when they happen with you. No settings ever perfect, no situations ever perfect. You have to adjust to it. Fear. I want to address fear first because public speaking is the number one fear. In fact, there have been five studies, and in all five studies, public speaking has remained the number one fear of Americans. And I think there's a number of ways we have to handle fear. The first is this. Consider that very much knowledge reduces fear. Knowledge reduces fear. I've heard people say, I wish I was three years old. I don't ever want to be three years old again. Do you know what three years old is? Think back to your days of three years old. I remember I would go to sleep at night and the sun would go down. I was frightened of the dark. I hear strange noises in the house. That frightened me. There were alligators under the bed, boogeymen coming in, and I was terrified of strangers. By the time I was six, it was a much better world. All strangers weren't bad. As a matter of fact, I realized the sun went down, so darkness was a natural course of events. And not only that, I got to know those household noises, and they weren't boogeymen. It turns out that what they really were were just bad household noises. So a lot of what we do today is going to not only reduce fear if you have it, but give you more confidence, because we're going to see ways that you can handle problems and give you more confidence. Number two, in talking about fear, I think we should go back to some of the studies, the greatest studies ever done on fear during the Second World War. Let's go back to London, the Blitzkrieg bombings in London. I mean, you had entire blocks wiped out, families were wiped out. 
Can you think? You talk about number one fear of public speaking. How'd you like to be in London? Have a giant thousand pounder drop in and blow away a block area and wipe out families. That's what happened every night in the streets of London. Does that sound more fearful to you? Let's look at what we find out from fear there because that was one of the most researched areas of fear that we have had ever. What happened in the streets of London when they gave people tests is they test them for stress. Do you realize the people who lived in the city of London then had less stress, less anxiety, less nervous breakdowns than we now in the United States or the people in London do today? Now how could that be? The interesting part is when they tested the people on the outskirts of London where they never saw a bomb in the rural areas, these people had high incidences of phobias, nervous breakdowns, anxieties, needed psychiatric care, and they never saw a bomb. Why? The fact was they didn't face fear. You see, if you worry about things, it gets a lot worse. The people in London handled it, knew they could survive, knew how to deal with it, and as a result, their fear was reduced. The people out in the country avoided it, they worried about it, and it became bigger than life. So for those of you who say, you know, I'm sort of concerned about this, I I I'm really afraid to get up and avoid any situations, you're making it worse. You're making it much worse. So face fear. They say that speech is the number one fear. I think they asked the wrong question. Let me ask it this way. Anyone, anyone have any idea what the number two fear is in most of the studies? I'm sorry? Yeah. Death. Death's about number seven in, in some of the studies. It turns out to be height. And you see, I think they asked the wrong question. Let me ask it this way. During the course of this presentation, I'm going to give you an all an opportunity to come up here and make a short presentation. I will whisper a topic into your ear. You will not know what the topic is. You will then get up and present for three minutes to your peers. Now, I believe in giving people choices. If you choose not to do that, here's what I will do. When we leave here this evening, we will go to the airport. I will strap on a parachute, take you up to 1,250 feet, and kick you out of a plane. <laughs> How many of you would rather go out of the plane than come up here? And the fact is, as I find in most audiences, you really wouldn't want to. And once in a while, when people raise their hand, I said, you raise your hand. But seriously, if you really got down to that hour, near the time we're going to kick you out of the plane, you think you might get up and they admit they would. So I think we ought to look at what happens with height. And if it's that fearful to paratroop, then let's look at a series of interesting studies by Stanley Rackman. What he was trying to find out is, how does the Army take young men from a situation of fear to courage, to absolute fearlessness in terms of going out the plane. How do you take people of 18 years old, have them qualify as jumpers, and take them clear up to master's jumper status? And we may learn something about reducing fear. Are any of you paratroopers? Take my word for it. Part of my experience as a Green Beret was to go through jump school. Let me tell you what it looks like. And I'll ask you periodically if it sounds fearful. The first thing they do is they put you in what's called a mock door. Now, the mock door looks like a plane door, same dimensions. You stand in it as you would in the door. You crouch ready to go with your hands on the side, and on go, you leave that door. Now, you look at the horizon. You don't look down. Once you leap out, you leap out, you bend at the knees, you look down at your shoes, you put your hands around an imaginary emergency chute, and you count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. Does that sound fearful to you? Not at all. To any of you, it might help to even tell you more that you're jumping a foot and a half into a sand pile nothing fearful. They want to make sure that you have the moves right. And then they move you when you have it down to the 34-foot tower. Now that's a different kettle of fish entirely. Because you are standing, they say, go, you're trained to look at the horizon, you leap out, you look down, and immediately you go through an eight-foot drop, you hit the cords, they stretch. It pulls you up this far from the ground. And the first time I did it, I thought I was going to drive myself on the ground. And I almost lost it all. But the interesting thing was Stanley Rackman has administered subjective fear tests to young paratroopers who go out that 34-foot tower. And he has found that by the time they go out the fifth time and he administers subjective fear tests, subjective fear is reduced substantially. By the time they hit the 11th jump, it's amazing what happens. All of a sudden, you become acclimated to it. I'm a slow learner. It took me till about the 14th or 15th, but I remember clearly how it was then. You go out, you leave, you're used to it, and you're doing things such as you're coming down, you're looking, saying, gee, I didn't notice that rock before. Look at that bush. Piece of cake, because you're walking back, watching these people jump out. They're living. You feel safe about it, no problem, and then they move you to the 250-foot tower. It's like one of those rides they have, except when you come down, there's no cords controlling you. And as you're coming down, they're shouting at you because the wind's blowing in the tower. They're shouting, climb those lines and climb those cords, and you're sitting working too hard to be frightened. 
by the time you do it the fifth or sixth time and they take you up in that chute, I swear, it's so quiet, you hit the 200-foot mark and you say, I wonder if this is what heaven's like. It's so peaceful. Look at those birds flying down there. And you get up and you're sitting in the harness at 250 feet. You're saying they're about to cut me loose and gosh, this is fun. And they cut you loose and this time you're blowing in the tower. But remember, knowledge is power. They told you what to do. And you look and say, I'm blowing into that tower. No problem. You just climb those cords, perfect control, and you have it made. You see, there's a basic law of change here. You want to reduce fear. You start small and add on progressively. Look what the paratroopers did. One and a half feet, 34 feet, 250 feet. You continually increase what you do. If you leave at the end of the day and you go back to your office and they say, hey, you went to that confident public speaking seminar, we want you to go out and talk to a thousand of our people in the field, run and hide, you aren't ready. <laughs> you are not ready because you're going to have to start at a committee meeting in a little way. Start to take notes, give the secretary's report, join a Toastmasters organization, speak up at a meeting you haven't spoken up, and step by step by step, that's how you come to be a great speaker. How do you get to be a master jumper? 65 jumps. And it's interesting, you see master's jumpers after 65 jumps, and to them, jumping out of a plane is like us getting a cup of coffee, getting ready for a day's work. You face it, a step at a time, and you start to get better, and you start to get better. There's another step to reducing fear, and that's envision yourself successfully engaging in speaking. Envision yourself successfully engaging in speaking. This whole kind of envisionment idea came out of Garfield's peak performance. It seems several Olympics ago, the Eastern athletes had developed visualization techniques for weightlifting. They could visualize themselves lifting tremendous amounts of weight. And Garfield describes being at a, a sports psychology convention. And he got connected with some of the East European coaches, and they took him down, and they actually had him lift more than he had lifted in his prime. He literally concentrated. He envisioned himself listen, lifting this. I'm going to suggest that's what you want to do as a speaker. Start to envision yourself succeeding. Because there's a basic psychological phenomenon that occurs, you're going to live up or down to your expectations. And so you start envisioning success. In fact, you imagine success so much that you have an inner voice that goes along with it that starts saying you're good and you start practicing and rehearsing. Now for those of you who haven't developed an inner voice, let me suggest to help because it really works this way. I suggest that what you do is you get yourself an executive teddy. <laughs> and what you do is you take the executive teddy home. Now sometimes I use executive teddies when I speak because I lose a little bit of confidence up here. But again, not just in vision, but this will help you also tell yourself I can be successful at it because you want that inner voice going so you can really have the vision. Sometimes I have audiences that are tough. You're pretty good today. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually bring Teddy out in a speaking engagement and I'll say, I'll say, Teddy, look at this audience. They, they look friendly enough, but you know how they can turn on you, Teddy? I don't know if I can do it. I'm about ready to address a bigger audience next week and I'm not even sure I can get through this one. Do you think, do you think I have what it takes to do it? Take a look at this group. I don't know if I have it. Do you think I can really do it? Teddy, you've got to tell me. I'm on my way to the top? You really think I can do it? You're a winner, Teddy knows. I'm a winner, Teddy knows. What I'm suggesting you do is get yourself an executive Teddy. Teddy, in addition to that, can say other things. You're on your way to the top. And what he can do is reinforce. You are one of a kind. You're one of a kind. Get yourself an executive Teddy. But those of you who have problems at work, put them in your desk. You need a little bit of praise. You're trying to have that vision. Follow these instructions carefully. Go into your office and first close the door. <laughs> take the executive teddy out what I'm suggesting you do is I do it mechanically you don't have to start saying hey I'm ready I can do a good job I'm one of a kind there's no problem and then envision success I want to tell you there's a difference envision yourself if you can envision yourself getting ready to speak and you literally come through this door ready to go envision yourself literally hitting the platform and you are on a roll and you are just giving it everything that you have you are on a roll you're a winner the audience is going to jump up and scream and holler and applaud you, and they're just going to go crazy standing ovation. It's not going to happen. <laughs> but your chance for it happening is a lot better that way than if you sit there and say, oh, boy, is this going to be a baddie? Because you can live down to your expectations. So really, really, envision success. I think it's absolutely critical. I think it's absolutely critical. So I think all these things that we talked about can help to handle fear.
Now, how do you begin? We've taken care of fear. You've gained confidence. How can we really help you in terms of avoiding presentation procrastination? And what I want to give you is a format that I think you can use. I'm going to organize this topic according to a word, oasis. O-A-S-I-S. -S. And if you write this down, I ask you to write oasis from the top down. An O, an A, an S, an I, and an S. And what we're saying here is that this is the organizational structure. I'm going to follow it, and let me on the side say we're going to learn at two levels. If you have to make a point or follow a certain organizational structure, make it easy for the audience to follow it. So make a word or an acronym. In this case, OASIS stands for Avoiding Presentation Procrastination. If I were to write this down, I'd even put it in green, because I've heard people talk about professional public speaking and say, gee whiz, public speaking is a desert. In deserts, you have oases. So symbolically, we deal with an oasis. And I'd have it in green. The O in OASIS. The O in OASIS stands for Organize Your Attitudes. Organize Your Attitudes. When I talk about organizing your attitudes, I want to talk about several issues. Number one, many of us have an idea that the audience is composed of rats. I mean, the audience is out to get us. The audience wants us to do badly. They're waiting for the mistake. That's not really the case. Many of you are here today, and you came. How many of you came here saying, boy, I hope that presenter falls flat. I hope that person stinks. I hope that speaker is so boring that I absolutely go to sleep and have to leave at lunch. If any of you hope for that, you need psychological care. <laughs> you didn't. And if you've ever watched a presenter have problems, what happens? Your heart goes out to them. You want them to do well. You don't wish them badly. Oh, there's a rare occasion. We're going to talk about that. 2% of the time in some unusual situations, but generally the audience is on your side. So number one, it's a group of friends. Don't worry about it at all. Secondly, again, to build confidence, let's put this in perspective. We hear a lot about presenting. The Accident Book of Facts tells us that last year, 21 million people died in household accidents. 24 million were seriously injured. According to the National Safety Council statistics, 45,000 people in the United States to 50,000 are going to die in automobile accidents during the year. I've looked through both books. Did you know there's not one recorded case of death due to stage fright or presenting a first presentation? <laughs> not one. As a matter of fact, it's the safest activity you can be engaged in. No one else wants to be here. You're in more danger out there. Someone can trip on you, drop a chair on you, the chair can break, you can hurt yourself, you can fall. You're relatively safe up here. Safest activity you can find in the country. So don't worry about it, it's safe. There's a third attitude I want to change. Our culture is so full of jokes about presenters. Six weeks ago in a trade magazine, they had two men looking into an audience. The one said to the other, do you want to let them enjoy themselves a little longer, or do you want to begin your speech now? <laughs> in another cartoon, they had a woman who just asked a gentleman a question. He has a very sour face, and his response is, I had to come. I'm one of the speakers. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, presentations don't have to be boring. As someone said, there are boring speakers, but never boring topics. So it doesn't have to be that way at all. What I'm suggesting is organize your attitudes. Get the attitudes straight. The A in Oasis is analyze yourself and your audience, but analyze yourself first. If you don't know how you're coming across, how in the world are you going to adjust to an audience? And there's a technique that I'm going to give you that works very, very well. Psychologists studied a number of years ago to predict how people behave. And they found basically four styles of behavior, and they're called behavioral styles. All of us will fall into one or two or three or four of these categories. As I go through these descriptions, I want you to think of the one that fits you, and I want you also to think of people in your organization that you deal with every day who fit one of the other styles. The first style is called the emotive. The emotive. Now, the emotive can be described by certain adjectives. Enthusiastic, informal, loves people. And these people in the organization are well-liked. They're the people people. They are process-oriented. They want to see the organization move. They want to get things done. They're fun to be around. They smile. They gesture enthusiastically. They can see the big picture. How many of you know people like this? Or how many people fit this mode? OK. Now, for those of you who fit it, and those of you who know people, some of you might be driven crazy by these people. Okay, and I already see from the laughter some people are. 
Now, these people, though they're fantastic people, have their quirks. They, for example, don't like details too well. They may be in an occupation that requires that they can develop the skill, but it's not their natural inclination. So generally, the tales are not their favorite sort of thing. If you have to proofread an annual report, don't give it to an emotive, because generally those kinds of details they're not going to like. Now, there's something else you ought to know about emotives. You ought to know that emotives, if you want them to hate you forever, all you have to do is not insult them, you don't have to treat them badly, ignore them. Emotives like being recognized. Emotives very often like being center stage. The second category is directors. Directors are process people. But unlike the emotive, they deal with facts. If you go into their office, they don't want to hear about the children. They'll say, we have about 10 minutes, what are the facts? They want to get down to business. To them, business is business. They separate it from that kind of relationship. They gesture too, but their gestures are forceful. Think of Lee Iacocca. He's a director. Now, the interesting thing about directors is they get a bad reputation. I mean, they are forceful, they take charge, they take command, but sometimes people say they're pushy, which is a negative sort of description. They really aren't pushy, but they operate under pressure a little bit differently. If it turns out the job is not being done and that deadline's rolling around, then they will get pushy. They're likely to say, we're going to get this job done with you, without you, through you, over you. You may be history, but we're going to finish. If you want to be with us, it's just fine. On the other hand, they are also willing to say they like people, because some people think they don't. Now, what do you never do to a director? Never, ever put a hopeless bureaucracy in front of a director, because if you do that, they're going to be frustrated. And if they're a good director, give them several days, and they're going to figure a way around, over, under, and frustrate you. So again, we need directors. You deal with a director, give them the facts. Tell them what can be done, and don't put a bureaucracy in front of them. Let's get to the third category. The third category is called reflective. I want to ask for a show of hands in a second. The adjectives that describe these people are precise, calculating, scientific. They do a lot of research. They're very detail-oriented. How many of you fit that category? This usually is the largest category in most groups. Incidentally, we need you. We need you folks to offset all the damage done by the directors and the emotives who are trying to take the organization in that direction. Because you give the organization stability. You give it stability. Now, what happens with you is you tend to research things. If you have a weakness, it's what we would call analysis paralysis. Sometimes you don't think you get all the information necessary. In most human activities, we simply can't have all the facts. So the big thing is that's a stumbling block. Number two, you're fantastic at details. You really work at it. I should know in dealing with you that if I'm in industrial sales, it's going to be a long sale. You're going to check my product, competitor's product, alternate technologies, and then finally make a decision. And if I deal with you, I better give you the details and be prepared to answer a lot of questions. For those of you who aren't reflectives, who deal with reflectives, be patient and understanding, because they are very wise people. They are product, not process. They want to know exactly what to do to turn a terrific product out. Proofread an annual report, give it to a reflective. They're superb. What do you never do to a reflective ever, or they'll hate you forever? tactlessly insult their work. It's like killing their children because they take it seriously. Now, again, you deal with these people, they want details. The fourth category is called supportive. They are lighthearted, they are well-liked, they are laid back, they are non-assertive. At meetings, they may not speak a lot, but these people are superb. Listeners, if you have consultative sales positions, put them in it because they listen. They often don't take political sides. They understand more about the organization than anything you can imagine. They feel content in knowing what the ground rules are. What you have to do in trying to deal with any kind of change with them is, number one, explain to them why that change is necessary for the viability of the organization. And second, even more importantly, then follow it up explaining how the change is not going to affect their position adversely. In fact, even spell out what they have to do to operate in a constructive way in the new environment. If you can do those two things, they'll buy your position. Now, we need all four of these kinds of people in an organization. More importantly, in terms of public speaking, the way this applies is, ideally, you're going to want to be as many of these four as you possibly can. You're going to want to take the characteristics on. Because if you talk to people, you may talk to one, two, three, or four, you may talk to one of these styles. And if you don't dovetail and match up, you're not going to communicate. There are two communication models, 
And a popular one says, the sender encodes the message, and it usually is encoded in his or her preferred style. That message is sent and interpreted by a receiver. The problem is, the receiver often has a different kind of behavioral style. So it's not a good model. A much better model looks like this. The sender encodes the message in his or her preferred style. That message is then translated by the sender into the kind of style that is appropriate for the receiver, and that message is then interpreted by the receiver. If you do that, we have people on the same frequencies understanding the message. If you don't do that, the understanding breaks down. Let me show you how it works. Let's assume for a minute I'm an emotive. I look out at you, and I'm going to say that you are a group of three people, decision makers. You are directors, you're emotives, you're reflectives. I give a fantastic emotive presentation. It is the big picture. I fire it out. It is there. And I look at the center, and my emotives immediately are nodding, smiling, saying, right on. I understand. I have it. I then say, I've just given you the big picture. Now let me give you the facts, because the director is looking with a very questioning look. I say, here are the facts. We're going to do this, this, this. And I gesture in a forceful way as I explain it. I now look down. I have an emotive still saying, aha. The director's removed the finger from the nose, Nodding also, but now I still have a questioning reflective. They don't have the details. I say, I've just given you the big picture. I've given you the facts. Now let me give you the details. Here is what we're going to do. The truck is going to roll up to the loading dock at 7.30 in the morning, and I throw all the details up in a gigantic perch chart, and I explain detail by detail how it's going to happen, and now I have three people who are all nodding yes, saying we will buy that particular proposal. How many of you take the time to make the translation? Did any of you do it? That's what you have to do. And here's the hard part. I sometimes in the seminars will tell people, OK, what I want you to do is practice this. And people really are anxiety prone because they can't do it. It's too difficult. You see, we have been conditioned in all our lives to play one style. We've been taught to take lowest, as I call them, safest kind of behavior. Now, we know that those people with the greatest variety of appropriate behaviors deal well with people, deal the best, not just one style. But what have we been taught to play it safe? Starts in school. Let me take you back. How many of you can remember a time in first grade or earlier when you wanted to answer a question in school? It's a long ways back. Do you remember that time? All the, how far back do you have to go? Way back, right? And I see some of you shaking your head. You can't remember. I can remember mine. It was first grade. And, and here's what happened. See if this isn't familiar. We had desks and chairs that fastened to the floor. I remember leaning forward grabbing the front of it, hooking a leg on the back chair. And, 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 and when you're really young, remember raising your hand like this? You throw it out thinking it's on a spring, and they're going to notice you more because the hand's going to shoot out farther. You throw it out wanting to answer the question. And I remember doing that, and finally the teacher called on me. I gave my answer, and the teacher looked me right in the eye and said, that's wrong, that's stupid. And I never spoke at school again. <laughs> Does that sound familiar? And you never sat in the front seat? And I've recently taught seniors in college See if this sounds familiar. It happens still today. They'll come in and think to your days in school. As a teacher, I could say, I'm going to ask a question. Do people respond to answer no? They go into mode number one. 60% of the class moves into mode number one, most popular behavior of students. Again, we have no carpeting. It's deafening. Pencils and pens hit the floor simultaneously of 60% of the students. So they can look right on the floor there and not make eye contact. You won't call them. Sound familiar? 20% of them go to mode number two, most popular mode. They've never taken a note. They've been there every day. And all of a sudden, magically, like magicians' canes, pencils and pens appear in their hands, and they are furiously writing notes. So you don't make eye contact. They don't get called on. And I've even seen this. I've even seen students come in and sit down very carefully between someone tall and broad. Because that way, you can look to the side. When the instructor says, I have a question, you just blend right in. And the fact of the matter is, when we talk about this behavior, it does not help you really communicate. We are saying expand the behaviors. Expand those behaviors. Use the four styles. Now, what do I mean by expand and use them? I don't mean there's a term called mirroring. When I say mirror the others, you become somewhat like them. You do not become a Iacocca. You do not become it. You take on some of the characteristics. Let me best show you what I don't mean. Tom Peters talks about Lee Iacocca, and I've seen this story in a number of places, trying to have people get the Chrysler convertible online. And apparently had a conversation with someone in research and development. Now, let's assume for a minute in that conversation, I don't know this for a fact, but let's assume 
that Lee Iacocca, a director, is talking to a research and development person who is probably a reflective. And we have this conversation. Lee Iacocca said, how long will it take you people in research and development to get me a working model of a Chrysler car here, a Chrysler convertible? To which the reflective would respond, well, Mr. Iacocca, it's going to take us some time down to get the drawings ready. We'll get it up to production. I don't think we'll have a working model, but we, we might have something up, up for you in, in several weeks. To which Lee Iacocca responded, why don't you get yourself a Chrysler, tear the roof off the doggone thing, and put a convertible top on? Incidentally, the side part of this is he got his Chrysler convertible a lot more quickly that way. But here's what I don't mean should happen. I don't mean when he said that, that the research and development person should have responded when he said, why don't you get a Chrysler, tear the roof off, and put a convertible top on? I do not mean that that R&D person who's a reflective should suddenly have said, hey, Lee, why don't you get the car, you tear the roof off, and you put it on? No. We don't need two directors shouting at each other. Here's what we need. We need to have that reflective come out of that reflective style, be a bit more forceful and say, Mr. Iacocca, this is what we can do, and deal with the facts. If you can have that happen, then you're going to have communication, and that's what I mean by mirroring. The S in Oasis is set goals. When I talk about setting goals, here's what I mean. We now, with the kind of research technologies available, can drown in the research if we're not careful. And I suggest set goals and work in reverse. Let me give you an idea. I went to Las Vegas for vacation last summer. I did not get there by backing out of my driveway and saying, gee whiz, less traffic, less traffic from the west, so I am going to go in that direction. Get to the corner and say, I want to save gas. There seems to be a wind blowing south, so I'll take that direction, and eventually meander to Las Vegas. That's not how it happened. I knew how to get to Vegas. I had it mapped out, and I got to the most direct route. Number one, it's going to really help you organize. So I'm going to suggest whatever you do is organize yourself, set those goals. The I in Oasis is integrate. How do you put the information together? I used to really get do this. I used to get legal pads. And on the legal pads, I used to have 22, 23 pages. Sometimes my first point that I'd like, and I would write all the information down, skip a line between, sometimes page six would have item number one. Then I'd turn to page nine for item number two. Then I'd cut these out and paste them in order. Then I'd come up with new information sometimes and have to change that. A lot of wasted time. Here's what I suggest. Start building this on three by five, four by six file cards. Put an idea, put a piece of information, put a transition, put these pieces of information on separate cards. If you can get it done on separate cards, you can put them on a table and organize them any way you want. The nice part is you have this organized. You get a better piece of information for point 33. You just pull that card out and substitute another one. Another advantage, you start building files. You finish that talk. Have you ever finished a talk and said, I wish I had the information, I don't know where to find it? What you do is you file this and you keep a running file box. I do a lot of different groups and do research, for example, for accounting groups. When I finish a talk, I have a file in every single group. I've done the research. I update it when I do the group again, but always maintain a file that keeps that stuff and doesn't just keep it in speech form, but can break it down into its various parts. And I think that's the best way to integrate. The final S in Oasis is start. And when I say start is you are ready, because if you've reworked it as we talked about, thinking about it, you've analyzed the audience, you've analyzed yourself, you've put the things together in terms of integrating, there's a process of creativity you've gone by called incubation. The sum is greater than its parts. What I'm going to suggest after doing that, you now have a pretty good product, you are ready to start in putting this together. You are ready to start. Now we've talked about overcoming fear. We've talked about Oasis. I want to wrap this point up with an example, I think, that I think can help you in a lot of ways in terms of finally giving you confidence on how to adapt these various styles and put it together. I want to give you an exercise that you can take, take home and use. And I want to talk my way through it. I talked about my background. I'm going to suggest you give yourself a very careful autobiography. Study your autobiography. If those of you say, you know, I'm really limited in this one style of behavior I don't know how to change. Think of all the people you were. Let me show you how it works. I described for you the fact that I was born in the country and had a very unusual name. In fact, my name is M-A-R-I-J-A-N. And I described what it did to my masculinity. At the time that happened, I had an idea of a very male, female creature. And I wasn't sure exactly who I was. To compensate for that, I became very macho. 
And I remember I didn't just wear construction hats. My whole diction, body tone, everything changed. I ate my vocabulary, went right down the tubes. I became macho in every possible way. I became a construction worker. That was part of my identity. Talked just like this. But didn't think this was macho enough, given my background. And so I decided I would join, as I told you earlier, the Green Beret Special Forces. You see this hand? It's what I look like when I shave it. When I don't, it looks like this. I became the animal. Man, I was tough and rough. I'd soon crack your head as look at you. Wipe that smile off your face right now. And I was mean. People were afraid of me. One day I decided this was less than human. And what I thought I would do is I would take a much more intellectual approach to life. And I thought what I would do is I would become a professor. Now, I took to wearing horn rim glasses. I should explain this, that professors usually wear horn rim glasses because we are indicate from research these wide horn rims make you appear more intelligent but more cold and impersonal. That way students don't talk to you and you, they don't realize you don't have the answers. But I started <laughs> becoming a professor and I took to smoking the pipe. My diction improved miraculously. I began to think and be like a professor. I became the sum total of human knowledge. I began to discuss axiologies, ontologies, epistemologies, and things that professors discuss. And one day discovered this just wasn't a whole lot of fun. <laughs> and so what I thought I would do is I would become crazy. And I became a good crazy. I could tell jokes. I could do magic tricks. I could do anything. My question for you is, who am I? Am I crazy? And you could say yes, and you're right. And I never want to lose that part. Was there a time in your past when you were a little crazy? Why is it locked up? Somewhere along the line is that you're too old, you're too educated, you can't do it. Learn to let it out. It's part of your personality, it's part of that emotive. And I've discovered that since I've let it out, I can laugh at myself and get along much better with people. How about the professor? Oh, he's still there. He's not the sum total of human knowledge anymore. The professor has too much respect for people who are blue-collar workers in trades. I judge people not by their titles. I judge people by how well they do what they do. That's how I think we ought to be judged. And I appreciate it. I know a fellow who lays asphalt who's a loot man who's an artist as much as any canvas painter, and I respect that. Construction worker, you bet. I'll always be a construction worker. The animal, I'll learn to take that temper and intensity and channel it. And this, it's made me more human. It's amazing. I talked about the incident and how serious it was. You know, funny when you put it in perspective how it's made me more human and things can change. Throw up the sense of humor. When I was discharged from service, I applied for admission to Southwest Missouri State University. All my records, academics, say M-A-R-I-J-A-N. They took one look at the name and they assigned me to the women's dormitories. <laughs> things were looking up. Once I got there, they discovered their mistake. My first job at the University of Tennessee, I was there one week, the Women's Faculty Association invited me to brunch. I had to go. I had a great time. Apparently they did too. I was the only male member of the Women's Faculty Association for my two years there. And I'm happy to tell you that when any of you women get cosmetic samples in the mail these days, I still get them. <laughs> Darlene gets two for one. And I've heard a lot of people concerned about affirmative action and the edge women have in the job market. Now I can put down... Marty Pascove, Rocco Pascove, M.R. Pascove. I don't in my resume. I put M-A-R-I-J-A-N. And affirmative action works for me. <laughs> and I love it because I get to walk in the door and they think it's affirmative action and walks the beard. I get a chance to look at some pretty nice jobs. My point is everything we talked about requires you to have a sense of humor. Let your past out. I think it's the secret to overcoming fear. It's a secret to everything. Take that autobiography. Don't take yourself too seriously. This concludes part one of Confident Public Speaking. Rocco stressed the importance of facing your fears, practicing your speech, and imagining your success. Notice how he used props like the executive Teddy to illustrate humor and to help you build up your self-confidence. Rocco discussed the OASIS method, organizing your attitudes, analyzing yourself and your audience, setting goals, integrating your information, and finally, starting your speech. While suggesting that you study your life story and include it in your presentation, Rocco used hats and glasses to emphasize his points. Next, in part two, Rocco discusses the importance of planning your presentation. I want to talk about researching.